Good day, everyone. May 7th. What are we? Thursday afternoon from sunny Winnipeg from uh, 201 Portage Avenue. I'm Rob Tatro from robtatro.com, portfolio manager from Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management here at the Tatro Wealth Advisor Group. I'm excited today because for the first time, we're going to be having an actual technical and quantitative expert to talk to us about specific stock patterns, what he's watching for, uh, what the what his basically his technical outlook is for 2020 in the stock market. I'm really thrilled. It's going to be neat. I, I've kind of reviewed some of the material that he's doing. Uh, really neat. Uh, Javid is a guy that I've kind of personally reached out to in the past. He's he's a, a crutch for us. He's a guy we rely on a ton, a crutch in the positive sense. Uh, we rely on him a ton to help us uh, with our analysis for specific positions for sectors. Uh, macro analysis. So Javed's based out of Toronto. I'm really excited to have him on the show. I'll introduce you to him in a sec. First, we should run the disclaimer. Uh, I'll let Mox, our producer, uh, take me to the disclaimer. Perfect. There you go. Reminder, folks, uh, this is not investment advice. Do not take this as investment advice. We don't know your personal situation. Uh, however, if you know if you do want to share your personal situation with us, please go to www.speaktorob.com. We'd be happy uh, to book a no obligation consultation with you. Happy to book a chat with you to chat about your personal situation. Um, go to the website as well. Uh, please take a second to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please take a second to subscribe to uh, our Facebook page or like our Facebook page. Uh, today, guys, we'd love to hear your questions or comments. We're going to be talking about patterns. We're going to be talking about you know, relative strength index. We're going to be talking about momentum and stock prices, signals, charts, trends. Uh, we're, we're looking at stock charts today, and we're going to be taking a deep look at them. So by all means, today's a great day to send us uh, your questions. We will get to them. Um, I will bring our guest in right now. Uh, folks, uh, live from not new york from toronto i'm excited and thrilled to be bringing in one of my partners someone that uh, has been, i've been working with hand in hand for a while here javid mirza quantitative technical analyst he's our research specialist from canaccord genuity corp javid welcome and thank you for being here thanks so much for having me uh, on the show rob yes uh, thrilled to have you hey i didn't tell you this javid but uh, this part of what i do here on the tatro show is part of it is journaling because i think mm -hmm. that someday my kids are going to be older and they're going to look at this and they're going to watch and they're going to think what a crazy world we live in mm -hmm. so as part of that uh, i do journal i tell the news that's happened in my life today big shout out to my brother charlie and his wife cheryl maybe he doesn't want me to share this but i'm going to share it anyways uh, they had a, a baby boy today so i'm an uncle oh. uh, i'm an uncle for the third time uh, Mikael, so I'm thrilled for them. Happy for Charlie and Cheryl. Uh, congrats, guys. That this the Yannick's gonna have a baby brother. The headlines, Javid, have you been following them uh, today a little bit? Yep. Yeah, you took a look obviously at the job numbers yesterday. Mm -hmm. What did yep. you think about the 3.3 million uh, unemployment claims in the U.S.? Well, it's funny for from the work that we do. It's uh, our our work is, and remember, the market's a discounting mechanism, so it's always looking forward. So. What we're not focused on is the actual number. Um, in what we're focused on is how the market's reacting to that number. Yeah, and and how do you think it reacted to that number positively? Obviously, yeah, positively. So obviously, you know these job losses and everything that's happened over the last two months is, has been uh, very challenging for everyone. However, the market is looking ahead. It typically looks ahead around six to nine months, and what the market is telling us. The rough patch that we went through from February to March, it's already discounted um, what our work suggests, the worst of the worst, and the market's looking ahead and it's seeing some sort of normalization on the horizon. What do you think about the Canadian job numbers that are going to be released tomorrow? The April job numbers, most analysts I think are expecting anywhere from three to four-ish million in terms of job losses. I don't know, did, did you guys put out a number for that or are you kind of just watching it closely? No, it's the same thing. We're just going to be watching the Canadian market reaction and seeing which sectors are reacting positively. I think one of the big areas that would be focused on here in Canada for the reaction to this report would be the financials. The financial stocks, specifically the bank, yeah. the insurance companies. Bank, exactly. Yeah, they're likely to be the most kind of directly impacted by the job numbers short term on the trading side for the stocks. And the biggest point is that they're 30 to 35 percent of the index. So how the financials move is how the market's going to move. Okay. I want to talk about Shopify. There's an article today 
uh, talks about how Shopify uh, entered into a partnership arrangement with Pinterest. Mm -hmm. That's less important than the actual belt. They have the title now, Jav. They're mm -hmm. walking around with a belt over their shoulder that says most valuable Canadian company. Uh, okay. They overtook Royal Bank uh, today or yesterday, I think it was. Shopify mm -hmm. founded in 2004. RBC founded in 1869. RBC had 46 billion in revenue and 12 billion in profit last year. Uh, Shopify had 1 billion in revenue last year and 100 million in profit. It is now the Canada's most valuable company. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I know that's a tough one to call. Do you sense any kind of Nortel, Blackberry-ish sentiment here? Not yet. So just so you know, as you know, we run that Canadian focused equity portfolio for all the IAs here at Canaccord. We're actually pretty overweight Shopify. Um, we've been bullish on Shopify for a while. And what's extremely positive is that the chart's broken out to new all-time highs. That's always something that's really bullish. And from the work we do, uh, we'd always be looking to buy new highs uh, in anticipation of the stock moving even higher. So everything from a technical perspective is extremely positive here on Shopify. And you can see it's leading Royal Bank, which still has not moved ahead of the highs that it made uh, later earlier this year. I remember you sent me a note a year ago. I think it was about a year ago. Uh, you were Kevin. I think it was you. And it was like uh, one of the most bullish signals that exist is an all-time high because, yeah. you know, in the 12 months following an all-time high, stocks uh, have outperformed their traditional own indices. You know, there the, the, there are numbers that are bad, but mm -hmm. generally, uh, I think it was 13% or something, the index when the, when the S&P makes an all-time high yeah. the following 12 months. So, I mean, if you never bought stocks at all-time highs, you would have never bought, you know, Microsoft and Google and Amazon and uh, exactly. gather your point with respect to Shopify. Um, I do want to talk about a couple other stories that uh, that made news today. Uh, oil, oil has rallied a ton. Mm -hmm. I do. I know you have some charts on oil today. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts briefly on this recent move, which is now I think six of the last seven days were positive for oil, mm -hmm. and we're now seeing numbers that we absolutely did not think we'd see for oil prices as recently as three weeks ago when oil was negative. Right. So. Same thing, uh, the futures uh, where we had, it was the latest contract. And so people were being forced to accept delivery. And that was a really big rochambeau on the retail side with what happened with USO and a variety of ETFs. And the issue is, is people just buy, like the USO is a US crude oil ETF, but people buy these uh, instruments, uh, especially on the retail side, and they don't always know exactly what's in there. So it was heavily skewed towards the most recent contract. And of course, uh, it went into contango, which means uh, effectively the bottom line is people had to accept delivery and all the storage was full. So that's why it was negative because nobody wanted to hold us. But the rallying over the last couple of weeks has been really positive. And what we're seeing is the market looking forward and seeing some sort of normalization in, in the future and in you know the quote unquote new normal. Now, one random aside, You've been, you're saying you've been doing this as a log, which I think is really cool. Have you been wearing masks uh, on this uh, as well? No, Javed. Well, that that would be cool just to see when you go back, just to see, you know, that. The, the, the I'll do it for mask. one of the shows. I'll definitely yeah. do it for one of the shows. <laughs> uh, do you, uh, I'm Rob Tatro again here live with our own Javed Mirza from Canaccord, Genuity Wealth Management, a technical quantitative analyst. Hey, do you mind explaining contango real quick? That's a, that's a comment. That's a term that people sometimes hear. So contango and how it impacts the price. Uh, yeah. So it, what it means is the, uh, I can, uh, off the top of my head, it's the current contract is worth less than the future contract. Yeah, it's kind of like an inversion, right? Exactly. And yeah. normally that's not what you see is you see a uh, future contract uh, worth more. So it's, uh, it, you know, usually when you see something like that uh, happening is there's some sort of disruption uh, going on. Okay. Hey, I want to talk another headline here that I yep. saw personally. I spoke about it this morning on Global News. For those of you who don't know, I'm on Global News uh, Morning as the, uh, I guess, the financial expert every morning at 8.06, 8.07 Central Time in Winnipeg. They asked me about the Chinese exports this morning. They were up 3.5% in April. We were expecting like a 16% decline and the exports were actually up in April. I didn't expect that. I don't know if you did, but that, that's a really good number for the economy as a whole globally. 
Yes, uh, I, I did see that. If that number is true, <laughs> then if... you don't believe all the data that's coming out of China. Is that what you're telling me? Pleading the fifth on that one. Okay, fair enough. Um, very briefly here before getting to some of these stocks, I want to ask your take on some of these stocks that are making highs. Uh, Square today announced earnings, you know, yeah. record because of the contactless situation. Peloton, the the bike, mm -hmm. all the companies that are kind of emerging here from this COVID thing. Do you think long term trends? Um, are good for company? Do you think the market is accurately pricing in what the situation is with those type of stocks? And I'm putting in, you know, Zoom and I'm putting in Peloton yep. and I'm putting in all those in the same kind of bucket. So here's what I would say. I think what's happened over the last two months has sharply accelerated trends that would have happened over the last year or two. You know what I mean? So we've been shifting to being able to do more work from home. And Rob, I'm saying, I'm sure the same's with you. Uh, normally when I do my work, uh, my weekly note, I'm doing it at home on Saturday and Sunday. I'm so I'm set up to, to work from home. Whereas, you know, 10 years ago, I'd have to go in the office and do it. So it's definitely much more convenient since I have small kids, but what we're seeing more and more with Peloton, Zoom, Square, all these trends, uh, are exacerbated by what's been going on with COVID-19. And I think once we come out of this, I think people will see uh, the quicker the changes that have been made and how, you know, despite everything that's happened, that's been really challenging for a lot of people. There's actually a lot of silver linings and this is definitely uh, one of them. I mean, your show is a perfect example of that as well. It's like you managed to do the news and highlight some really good topics and have some great guests on there. And before, you know, I'm sure five, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have been able to imagine that you were able to do all of this work and create a, what you have uh, all by yourself or I mean, with your team. One yeah. year ago, David, I would have never, yeah. never thought of this. It's crazy what this has done. And I, I always thought for me personally, I, I say this on every show, it, it gives me a ton of time to be introspective with respect mm -hmm. to my life, with respect to my business. And this, this new age, like every morning when I, when I see my staff on, on a Zoom screen and they're all kind of in their home or in their basements and we're all connecting remotely and never thought in my life that I would be, you know, in a situation where I'm working with an entire team of this size remotely yeah. and everyone's efficient you know it's yeah. it's it's a new age for sure i wonder how much of it is going to stay permanently i saw a report bmo has i believe 80 percent of their staff working at least partly from home yeah our numbers somewhere around that too they have a lot of employees uh, mm -hmm. i wonder long term what that number is going to look like we had some of our staff before this working from home mm -hmm. uh, from time to time either you know for travel or for you know, the odd day here and there. So we were kind of ready for this much more than some were. Mm -hmm. And we all have laptops. So it was, it was easier for us, but crazy. Yeah. What, what's happening uh, on the Canadian side, a couple of stories that made news today, BNN, um, just some of the BNN headlines, some of these companies that are filing for credit or protection. So Aldo is one of them. Uh, the other one I saw J crew, um, some of these kind of retailers that are filing for credit or protection. Um, any comments with respect to that, Javid, or I guess you're well, not surprised. No, it's it's the exact same, you know, that I, to what I relayed previously is. So you're seeing stocks that are going like this, that this COVID has accelerated that trend, exactly what you're saying on Square. Conversely, you're seeing, you know, as you mentioned, J. Crew and Aldo, the trends were like like this, but it's just, you know, accelerated that to the downside. You follow trends extremely closely, right? That's yeah. like your that's bread your and butter. <laughs> bread and butter. It's what you go to sleep thinking of every night. Okay. Um, I do a lot of sports. Uh, sports. I go to bed thinking of stocks and sports. But trends is something that you know intimately, and we're going to take a look at them very mm -hmm. closely here. Um, some of the earnings, real brief. Uh, we're we're going to be getting bank earnings. Any thoughts on bank earnings that are going to be coming up? Canadian bank earnings. It, so right now, the, the charts uh, are waiting for the bank earnings. So what I mean by that is uh, you've had the stocks come down and then you've had a bit of a rally. But since then, you've seen the stocks in this. Uh, I'm trying to do figure out what it looks like on the screen in this kind of sideways triangle pattern. And the triangle pattern is uh, it, it's narrowing. So what that means is, uh, let me see if I can draw it like this. So what that means is you had a broader band, but now it's getting narrower and narrower and it's waiting for a breakout. So whichever okay. direction that breakout takes is where the next longer term three to six month trend is going. 
Okay, I'm going to share my screen here, Javid. I'm going to take yep. you through some of the slides that you've prepped uh, for us for this call today. This first one here is a secular bull market that is under pressure. So first of all, explain what a secular bull market means. And then you talk about RSI and the key 50 level. Mm -hmm. So secular bull market, what that means is secular means a longer term trend. And from our perspective, and what we're talking about here is the longer term trend in equities. So those blue lines you see there, those are secular bull markets and equities, and they effectively last 20 to 25 years. Those red boxes are secular bear markets, which are effectively 10 year sideways trading ranges. So we actually have the longest view of anyone on the street. As far as I know, our view is that the secular bull market has upside into 2030. So the other indicator you asked me about is RSI. It's a pretty common technical indicator. It just measures for? It, relative strength index. And all it's measuring is the relative performance of the price of the stock uh, relative to the last 14 periods. So if it's trending higher, it's telling you that the stock is moving higher over that time frame. And if it's trending lower, it's telling you it's moving lower. And the key takeaway here is if a stock is above 50, it means it's trending higher on RSI. And if it's below 50, it's trending lower. And you can see in those red boxes in the second panel, that RSI has moved below 50, and that's been a confirmation that we've moved into the secular bear market in equities. And the key takeaway here is that RSI on the S&P 500, which we use as the barometer, it's the broad barometer for quote unquote the market, is remains above that 50 level. So in our view, that is still, we are still in a secular bull market. And we view and our work suggests that what's happened here has been similar to the 1987 stock market crash. So if you notice where that lies on the chart, you can see roughly uh, that little dip there or the little rise and then the dip in 1987. But if you zoom out, uh, it's uh, within the context of this 20 year uptrend from 1980 to 2000. And that's where we think we are now. We think we, if we're correct, we have another 10 years of this upside, I mean. The chart that we're seeing here, guys, is a 100-year chart. So from 1920 all the way to 2020, uh, three secular bear markets that Javid has identified, the 30s, the 70s, if you will, and the early 2000s. Um, the key indicator that Javid mentioned there is a 50, the number 50 on the RSI. Uh, as long as your RSI remains above 50, you continue to have a strong technical positive. Now, we, we are below, approaching or below? Uh, oh, 50 you're, now? You're, yeah, you're approaching 50, but we've held in above it. So as long as we remain above it, we, we're constructive and we view that we're in this and remain in this secular bull market. Okay. Now, how long would something have to dip below 50 in your view for it to be, for you to kind of raise the alarm bells thinking we might be in a secular bear market based on this indicator alone? Yeah. And so what I would say is, uh, you know, I'm a CFA charter holder and uh, for anyone who's done the CFA coast, their course, uh, they talk about mosaic theory. And what mosaic theory is, is if you piece together uh, a variety of different elements to help you come up with a story. And so what I would say is there's a variety of technical indicators. So it's not, and people who have been in the business long enough know that there is no golden bullet. What you're looking at is a variety of indicators. And if they're all telling you the same thing, then it's extremely probable that what they're telling you is correct. So sometimes you have instances where only one indicator will tell you something, but the rest are still flagging in, in, in the other direction. So what we'll be looking for is a couple of indicators. And we'll talk about this as we get later through these slides, one of the other indicators we're looking for. Yeah, and I think this is an incredibly important point, Javid, and I want to make sure our viewers understand this. My, so you and I have different jobs. Your job is to advise guys like me and advise institutional investors on what is happening in the charts. What is happening yep. in the charts on a quantitative basis with respect to the patterns that you see that you've been trained to see. My job is to build portfolios for individuals based on their risk tolerance, based on their situation and to offer them wealth advice. So when I take it, when I take, when I gather information and build these portfolios, obviously I'm going to take all the information I can from Javid. I'm going to take all the information I can from, you know, our economists, you know, maybe a Tony Dwyer, maybe a uh, Martin Robert, who's been on the show before, some of the macro guys. And for us, we take all those pieces and we form an opinion based on your personal situation. And Javid, you just said, even for your 
technical opinion. You take a whole bunch of indicators and you kind of apply them to one kind of position on that. So incredibly important folks that there is no one size fits all indicator that you should live and die by. So uh, let's take a look at the next, uh, actually uh, on, uh, so Walter, it's relative strength index to answer your question. Um, the RSI's relative strength index, price momentum, the price momentum. Do you have a quick second to explain the top panel here, price momentum? Yeah, so it's, it's essentially the first derivative of price. So basically it's, uh, you know, when you did calculus and you, you calculated the first and second derivative. So it's telling you at the margin, so first derivative, again, first, second derivative for you and I, that's a that's a quite uh, common topic. But the first derivative is the effectively the change, right? The, da yeah. the, the daily change, and it's calculated on a percentage, or, or not, it's not a percentage, but it's a derivative based on day to day. So go ahead, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, and what I would say is it's the difference between uh, different moving averages. And there's a variety of these momentum indicators, but they're all very similar. One of the most common ones that people talk about is MACD, uh, which stands for Moving Average Convergence Divergence. That's MACD. And all it's telling you is in which direction uh, price momentum is moving. Now, the reason all these indicators are important, because I'm sure you've heard studies and, you know, there's that famous book, uh, A Random Walk Down Wall Street, where they look to tell you that, you know, technical analysis doesn't work. But it turns out there's been a lot of studies since then that, that show that it, it actually does work. But the, the key reason we have these different indicators is because people, you can get 10 different people looking at this chart and they can give you 10 different observations. But once you start getting the math involved, and you're looking at the mathematical output, then it takes that chart aspect and interpretation aspect away, and then you have that mathematical model. The reason that's extremely important, and it's funny because I just read an article on BNN where, where they were talking about this, is that more and more money is being moved by algorithms and machines. And what do algorithms and machines use? This. Quant. <laughs> this is what they're doing. So yeah. it, it, it's hilarious when I talk to, you know, some people who, who, who are like, like this. And if you open your eyes and you look at this, it's like, at the very least, you don't have to use it, but at least you see what the machines are seeing. And the machines, you know, and this is what I talk about later. It's the rise of the machines. There are new masters. Yeah, there's a movie called I think it's a Terminator T3 or something. There Terminator, that's exactly it. That's yeah. I, I draw inspiration from that. And that's, it's exactly it. They don't care about us. All the machines care about is what the math is telling them. What percentage of the trading, um, by the way, you are a machine, Javid. Anyways, <laughs> what percentage of uh, trading on a day-to-day -day basis in Canada would you say, if you had to guess, I know you don't know the numbers, yeah. is attributable to the machines? I'd say anywhere from 60 to 70%. Yeah, it, it's not like... It's obscure now. It's the odd machine that's doing the trading. Yeah. Like there are days, I don't know if you remember this day in, I want to say May or June, 2010. Do you remember that day, Flash Javid? crash. Flash crash where yeah. we saw back then the, the TSX was at, I don't know, 10, 10 11,000 or something. And it dropped a thousand points in like three minutes or something. Yeah. Yeah. And it immediately came back six minutes later. Yeah. And, you know, I wasn't at my desk, so I didn't see it. I didn't notice it, but like, there's no way humans are able to trade that quickly down and that quickly up, right? That, yeah. that cannot happen unless you yeah. have algorithms. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure you'd All right, let's go to the next slide here. Um, the This is the NASDAQ Infotech. What are you watching here? This is NASDAQ Info Information Technologies with respect yeah. to price, RSI, and long-term trends. Yeah, so our view here is that information technology is leadership. It's funny, I mean, look at the names that you just mentioned. Square, Shopify, those are all information technology names, Microsoft, Facebook, Google. Well, I guess Facebook and Google are more on the communication services side. But you start the bottom, start yeah, exactly. But the bottom line and the key takeaway is that information technology here is leadership. And then so what we do is we highlight again on RSI there is that key 50 level. And what you can see is in the tech bubble from 2000 to 2002, and then most recently during the financial crisis from 2007 to 2009, RSI moved below that 50 level. But notice that we remain well above it here. So if we do move below that 50 level, which would happen if the index continues to deteriorate in price, then of course that would suggest two things. A, that we're moving into a secular bear market, 
which, you know, if you go back and uh, look at the previous slide, the reason that's important is, you know, we've had a pretty big move lower. But if we are in a secular bear market, then ultimately we could go around test the 1700 level on the S&P 500. So that still means we have some, some room to go to go to the downside, which is so which is why we're watching all these things so closely. But if we do go below the 50 level on the NASDAQ, that to us would strongly suggest that there's a change of leadership in line with a shift into a secular bear market in equities. And we'll talk about that a little bit down the road as well. Yeah, like the the chain, the dipping below 50 is going to happen, in my mind, on the S&P way before it's going to happen on, on the NASDAQ, correct? Exactly. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's because of the leadership right now. Although if that switches, that would be a strong bearish indicator for the technical stocks, the tech stocks. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Now, you, you got some neat blue and red lines here. Yep. I, I know what these are, but do you mind kind of sharing what your thought, you know, how you draw these yep. support? And how, where, where do you pick these points the, to draw these lines in this? Like you have a line here at 2781, you have a line at 4573, yep. and you have a line at 6496. So uh, the blue lines and the way I do all my work is red lines are typically uh, negative or resistance and blue lines are support. So uh, support, you know, for anyone who's interested in reading up in this, there, there's a lot of introductory technical books. I think the one from John Murphy, it, it, anything from John Murphy is great. But the key takeaway is that technical analysis uh, for people who don't understand it is, is it incorporates a lot of fundamental analysis. And what I mean by that is these inflection points that we're seeing on charts are levels where the index is either overvalued, uh, which means it becomes a resistance level, or it's undervalued, which means it becomes support. So when it's undervalued, it means all the fundamental portfolio managers from their models are showing that the stocks are undervalued and this is an, a great opportunity to buy. And what we as technical uh, technicians is we see this happening on the charts because these are areas where typically once you come back to uh, those levels, uh, stocks hold in pretty firm and they rally. And conversely, uh, once they come up to a level uh, of resistance, it's telling you that portfolio managers are seeing the stocks fundamentally extremely uh, overvalued. And so that's typically where they sell. Yeah, like I've seen you draw a ton of these in, in my in my dealings with you. And typically the the support will be kind of at, at spots where the market dropped to that point, came back, mm -hmm. dropped to that point, came back, dropped to that point, came back. Yep. Sometimes it's an emotional number, right? Like sometimes it's just, you know, it'll be a round number like 4,500 or 6,500 where people or, or algorithms will choose to sell or buy at that level therefore it's a it's a resistance and or support but sometimes it's just basically based on 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 charts right yeah and and like i said the charts are derived from the models that uh, actual fundamental portfolio managers are, are using yeah really really neat stuff let's go to the next one here uh this is your line in the sand chart i really like this one um this is for the S&P 500. So the yeah. S&P 500 for our guests out there that don't know, this is the large cap index, the American. And I know you do some charting for Canadian stocks. You do quite a bit, but yeah. this presentation is largely focused on American. Um, so, so take me through this chart and, and why it matters. I mean, you talked about closing above the four year average. Why is that important? Yeah. So let me back up and tell you, I mean, our focus is on uh, the S&P 500 and North American indices. And I'm sure you've had the uh, heard the saying when, uh, you know, when the U S sneezes, Canada catches a cold. So COVID. what, yeah. So, <laughs> so whatever's happening uh, in the U S is going to have a big impact on Canada because it's our largest trading partner. So if the U S economy is running smoothly, that should be great for Canada. And conversely, if the U S economy is under pre pressure, then there's not as many consumers for Canadian, uh, services and products. So that red line that you can see there, uh, the thin red line in the second or in the main panel, that's the four year or 200 week moving average. I'm sure, you know, most of the people listening to the show have probably heard of the 50 or 200 day moving average. No, so let's pause. Let's pause there, Javid. Yeah. Some people might not have heard it. So a moving day average is effectively you take the prior 50 days, if it's a 50 day moving average, or you take the mm -hmm. prior 200 days, if it's a 200 a day average. In this case, it's a 200 week average, which is a yep. four year average. So you take the prior 200 and you average it out. 
it, yeah. it smooths it out dramatically, which is why this red line looks so straight is because you're averaging out 50 trading sessions or 200 trading sessions, or in this case, 200 weeks. So it is an incredibly smoothed out average. Go ahead. You were saying. No, and th that's that's a great interject interjection. And what it does is without, you know, like I said, and this is what we talked about earlier, if you look at the actual price chart, it's choppy and, you know, you, people can have different interpretations, but that's why we're always looking at first and second derivatives of these prices and price patterns. And you can see what that chart is telling us, the long-term chart. Remember, a lot of my work or most of my work is predicated on these 100-year, 20-year, 30-year cycles. And you can see that the longer term trend is up. And so that red line has been a key line in the sand. And those blue circles highlight over the last 10 years when the S&P 500 has come back and challenged that level. But notice each time it's battled around that level in 2011. In 2016, it bounced off that level. And again, in 2018. So right now, uh, we've moved below it for the first time in 10 years, but we're back above it. And I think we're, you know, we can continue to chop around above it for the next couple of weeks or next couple of months. But ultimately, the market is going to, the stock market is going to tell us what is happening with the economy. It's a leading indicator. It's always looking around out six to nine months. And right now, the stock market is telling us that six to nine months from now, the economy is going to have recovered and stabilized. But the key is over the next couple of months is what's going to happen to the stock market because that's going to be a good barometer for, you know, six to nine months down the road, what's going to happen to the economy. Very nice. So you talked about how the S&P 500 has reclaimed the critical level for the last two weeks, yeah. a very strong technical positive. It supports the resumption, as you called it, of a long-term bull market in equities. And for those of you who don't know, a bull market is a positive upward momentum market. I believe I have a statue in the back here of a bull and a bear. Yeah. Uh, the bear market is the opposite. It's a negative market. So bull and bear, if ever you're not sure. One of the neat uh, times I got to go to New York, I got to uh, get on that that world famous bear and the world famous bull in front of the stock exchange. That was fun. That yeah. was I don't know four or five years ago. Super fun. Let's get to the next slide here. Um, I'm here. Actually, with, I'm Rob Tetro, uh, Rob Tetro .com, portfolio manager at Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. I am here uh, with Javed Mirzar, quantitative uh, and technical analyst and a researcher from Canaccord Genuity Corp. Javed. Take us through this one here. This is your rise of the machines chart, the S&P 500 and the V bottom. Yep. Um, this, is a, well, this is a neat chart and it's, this is a 20 year chart for those of you that are looking at it. Yeah, and actually, do you mind if we go back actually to the yeah, first absolutely. chart? Because there's something I wanted to discuss, which is Please. Um, pretty uh, important. And no, the, the very first uh, slide. First chart? With, yeah, with the, the that this one. one. Yeah. So, when we talk about, and the reason is I'm keying off when you talked about secular bull markets. So what a secular bull market is, it's these 20 to 25 year uptrends. You can see those blue arrows, but ultimately what it means is the economic environment for growth is ripe. Okay. And so just so people who are watching, I went to school at uh, U of T, uh, had an undergraduate uh, degree uh, in, in business. So I majored in economics. And it's just telling you that the environment is ripe. Interest rates in this secular bull market are low. Like if I wanted to go out, start a new business, you know, once this pandemic uh, thing is over, you know, you could get a hundred, two hundred thousand dollar loan at like, you know, two, three percent interest rates. So the underlying environment, uh, globalization, trade, I could set up a, 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 a store in Shopify really quickly. And it's just telling you that the underlying secular conditions for growth right now are extremely ripe. And the, the one thing I wanted to highlight uh, and talk about on this chart is if you just look at that long term chart, what that is and what that represents is human innovation and growth. OK, so if you look in the 20s, we had, you know, we just started getting off horses onto automobiles, 40s, 50s. We just started getting televisions, 2000. We just started getting the Internet. But the bottom line and the key takeaway, and I just want to leave a really positive message for people just because, you know, what's happened here has been really challenging. But humans, we adapt, we overcome. And this looking back Right now, things, of course, are really challenging. But if you step back and you look at these very long term trends, it just tells you that we will survive. So sorry, let's, no, let's go back to the other side. 
great because this is the kind of message I always give my viewers. I always remind them to be positive. You know, with my dad last week or a couple of weeks ago, I gave this whole spiel about how we will prevail. Capitalism will prevail because yeah. we are good at creating wealth in North America. Mm -hmm. We're good at creating wealth. There's always a dollar to be spent. It's cheap money right now. So we will create wealth and capitalism will prevail. And I echo your comments. It's almost like you, I set you up for that comment, Javid, but I swear to our viewers, I did not. You said yeah, that no, on you your village. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm an incredibly positive guy too. So let's talk about this chart here, the rise of the machines. This is the, the algorithms, the machines that are trading. Yeah. So, and this is what I want to highlight. So the, the top panel there is a very long-term chart. I think it's 20 years of the S&P 500. Exactly. Now take a look at the bottom panel there. All that is, is, uh, you know, I don't want to get into too much detail, but it's just tell, it, it's a great indicator of when, uh, the price patterns have either gotten very oversold, which is when they're around that blue line, the thin blue line at the bottom, or if they're very overbought, which is when they're uh, above that, the red line. But the, the key takeaway and the point is, is take a look at the, the 2000 to 2002. You can see those blue shaded boxes and where that indicator was. So that was during the tech bubble when it burst, that was around the lows. And then take a look at the financial crisis and what happened there and where those indicators got. 0809, yeah. 0809, exactly. But what the, the really important thing, and this is why I talk about the rise of the machines, and this first happened in 2018. And just so you know, in 2018, we had that call out and you know we were advising Rob and his entire team and everyone at our firm, look, it's time to step in and buy because this indicator is at levels that is beyond anything we've seen both in, during the financial crisis. Sorry, go ahead, Rob. No, no, I just wanted to tell you to thank you for that. And not yeah. only you, but some other people at Canaccord, but we made uh, 4,000 trades December 22nd, 23rd, 21st, 22nd, 23rd. Yep. We were buying aggressively uh, based on some of these indicators and mm -hmm. my, my clients, thank you. And obviously, you know, I thank you because we were, you guys were spot on and we were spot on on that call. So good yeah. call on there. And we ended up making a lot of money on that trade. Awesome. So what I would say is here, um, but notice how deep down that indicator got. So the, the key point is that indicator got to levels beyond what we saw in both the financial crisis and the tech bubble. So why would what happened during a span of three to four months take us beyond levels we'd seen in two major corrections in secular bear markets? That doesn't really make sense. And what happened is over the last in March, we got to below those levels as well. So this is a monthly chart, but I actually have weekly data and though that indicator got to levels below what we saw in December 2018. So what this is telling me, if you step back, is within the last two years, we've surpassed levels we've set in the last 20. And this speaks to our point, and you can see that in the bottom bullet, that algorithms and machines, they're moving more and more money. And so Humans, you know, we have, you could say, buy, sell, and hold. But the machines, they're ruthless. They don't care. They're binary. So they either have sell or buy. They're long or they're short. That's exactly. It. And so they were in sell mode from February to March. And so the question I posed to all my readers in, in the weekly note that we put out, uh, in March, I said, look, we think there's going to be a V bottom. Why do we think so? Well, up till now, the machines have been on zero, which is sell. What happens when they flip to one, which is buy, right? And so that's why we've had this V bottom. And that was our call is because the machines have been turned back on to buy. Yeah, really interesting stuff here. The uh, they, They're a much bigger portion than they ever were in our lives. And humans cannot move the market that quick, that no. fast. And I know because my clients, you know, they don't make decisions in the middle of the day at, at 1 27 PM to sell everything. Like that's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a process that happens over time. So I, I, I had a strong feeling it was an, an aggressive machine move. Uh, I'll take you to the next chart here. Reminder folks, I'm here with Javed Mirza, a technical analyst, quantitative uh, researcher here at Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. Javed, this is a four year cycle history. You've, you've spoken about this four year cycle before. Please tell our viewers about it. Yeah. So within this, uh, and I'll use my arm here. So within this longer term 20 to 25 year cycle that we've talked about, you have these uh, three to five year cycles that occur 
pretty much uh, like clockwork. And it's other people have, uh, you know, there's been economic studies done on this and it's an inventory cycle. But the key takeaway is typically every three to five years, and those are those uh, horizontal lines that we've highlighted there, uh, is a, sorry, vertical lines, is uh, a three to five year major market low. So uh, from our work, uh, 2011 was a major four year cycle low, and so was 2015, and then most recently, 2018. Now, this pandemic, in our view, uh, and you can see those green lines, that's when there's been aberrations where things have been knocked off course. And the first green line there, that was the 1987 stock market crash. And as we go through and visit, you know, as we update this deck, we're gonna have another green line here highlighting the COVID-19 pandemic, which in our view is a black swan event and not a bigger economic shift. Yeah, I think you have a slide on this here next, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah black swan event right here, the yeah. average four year cycle um, yeah. I'll let you. I'll let you take you take us through this. Yeah. So this is uh, a great example of what we we're discussing. So, if you take a look at the slide, the the blue dotted line around the middle is the average track of all these four year cycles. So all we've done is we've taken all the individual cycles, aggregated them, and we've come up with an average. And the red line was the 2018 cycle. So the you can see where it says year zero. That was December 24th. So from that point, you can see how the red line pretty closely tracked that dotted line right around the middle. And then you can see the sharp drop off we've had over the last two months. But what you can see is the market is slowly trying to get and fight its way back uh, on track. So, you know, this has obviously caused a lot of uh, disruption across the board we're going to have to look at our models and see what this does but our view is that you know as long as we remain above that four-year 200 week moving average and as long as our side remains above 50 we think that this has been a black swan event uh, if you don't know what a black swan is uh, there's a great book out by nassim taleb where he just talks about these low probability unknown uh, unknowns uh, that can happen and uh, this in our view was definitely uh, one of them yeah, it's like me making the NHL. Yes, yes, that, that would, would be a black, black swan, swan event. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be a flock of black swans. I think um, the S and P target here for 2020. You have it on your chart, so I yep. do want to address it. That's yep. a bit of an elephant in the room. 3,700 yep. for for the end of this year. Yeah. So That's let me. So really. High. Yeah. So we put that target out at the start of the year. You can see where you see where it says year one when we were tar when we were tracking that uh, average four year cycle very closely now all we did was extrapolate where we were at that point in time extrapolate where we would be at the end of year two and then we just did some math and, and found out where we were currently in terms of the s p 500 which i think was around 3100 3200 and we just extrapolated out uh, to the end of the year which was 3700 now we could have changed that but you know, you've worked with me for a while. I'm always all about, you know, being transparent and, you know, integrity is extremely important to me. And so we just left it there. We just wanted to highlight, look, that was our target. That's the work we did. Let's see where we go from there. And if there needs to be a critical assessment, but our view is the way the market's drawn and come back here is I still think we could print new uh, all time highs later this summer if the market continues to stabilize. So I think, I don't think we're going to get to 3,700, but I do think, you know, we could come to around 34, 3,500. Wow. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. That's, I hope you're right. Boy, do I hope you're right. Um, and I, I do like that about you. Like in, in a way, this COVID thing, when it comes to technical analysis of charts, mm -hmm. I mean, you kind of get a free pass because I, I know you shouldn't get a free pass because this is your job, but I mean, th this doesn't exist on any charts ever, a kind of black swan event like COVID, like, we, like we've seen in the last two months. Mm -hmm. So there, there's no technical analyst ever that could have charted for something like that. So no, that's a more macro, macro side of things. So I'm going to give you a free pass on that one. Well, so if you recall in uh, January, February, we were actually talking about an intermediate term correction. And we were actually warning clients that there was an intermediate term correction coming. Now, that being said, the intermediate term correction we were looking for was eight to 10%. Yeah. So your run of the mill standard pullback from new highs. 
nobody was looking for 35 percent yeah as my dad calls it a healthy correction as my yeah. dad is. <laughs> i went on bnn on january i think it was 28th or something like that yeah. not too long after i got that note and we had done our own charting at my end here and my dad and i were talking stocks every single day and i went on bnn and i said exactly what you said i said i, I think we're we're pulling equities off the table here. We think yeah. markets are overvalued right now. We think there could be a 10% correction. Obviously, I didn't expect a 35 or 40%. No, no, one, no one did. Yeah. But uh, I, I would agree with you. And I think we were on the same page in January as well. And yep. we actually did do some, we did some profit taking in our portfolios on that. Yep. Um, I'm going to take you to here the next slide. Uh, Again, my I'm Reiner guest, uh, folks, my guest here is Javed Mirza, technical analyst, uh, researcher at Quantitative An Technical Analyst Researcher, Canaccord Genuity Corp. And I'm Rob Tatro from robtatro.com, portfolio manager at Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management, Tatro Wealth Advisory Group. This is a this is your four-year market cycle model, and you were explaining that it's been shifted. So this yeah. is generally five phases. You've, you've likely seen this. If you've done any, any research on stocks, you likely understand kind of the market tops, the bull market, the tops, yep. the lows. And this, we kind of just see a, an undulation pattern that is in perpetuity kind of going upwards. Mm -hmm. You think that there's been a shift? Yeah. So what this is, and let me lay the, the framework for this. This is a market cycle model, which anyone who follows the markets is familiar with. And what you're going to see is, you know, people have been talking about, hey, this bull market, it's the 10 year bull market. At some point, it was like the longest bull market. And so everyone was saying that, hey, look, we're at the market top. Uh, and you can clearly see in phase three, the market top phase. But what and this is through no fault of, of their own as strategists, is they take the entire 10 years we've been through and they put it into one into this cycle as one cycle. What we do is we take this, you know, 20 to 25 year long term bull market and we put each of these cycles within there that last three to five years into the model you have in front of you. So in December 2018, when we were saying, look, there's a major market low, we said, look, if you take a look at that phase one, that's where we were. And so last year, the whole year, we were out telling people, look, we're in phase one. And this year, at the start of the year, we were saying, hey, look, we're shifting into phase two. This is the stocks that should work. And then, of course, you know, everything was derailed with uh, what happened here with the COVID-19 pandemic. And so what you can see is at the top in phase four and five, you can see the sectors that are typically working. We have other work that we do that shows you uh, how the sectors are doing underneath the surface of the actual index. And so what's been working is the defensive sectors. And you can see that in phase four and five. It's been staples, healthcare, utilities. But as you come out of the bear market and into the market bottom, what you want to see and take a look at phase one is you want to see financials, technology and cyclicals working. Well, lo and behold, if you take a look at our work, it's telling you right now that technology and cyclicals are working. So take a look at Amazon, take a look at Shopify. So all those areas of the market are working. There's one area of the market that is not working, that needs to get working, and that this whole, everything kind of uh, is holding on, and that is financials. So banks, you know, bank reporting is going to be big. You're, you're seeing the same thing in the U.S. The financials in Canada and the U.S. really need to pick up. And, of course, that's all going to be predicated, and we can see that in how the U.S. 10-year yield does. Yeah, I think I think we're all waiting for the financials to move. Um, I would agree here. Yeah. I'm going to skip a couple slides here. I want to you talk to me about um, the where am I right here? This one here. Yeah, the TSX versus the S&P 500. This is a question I get a ton. I think, you know, we are underweight Canada mm -hmm. have been overweight US for a while. Um, what, what are your thoughts here? This is the TSX versus the S&P 500. Yeah, so the, the key takeaway is Canada has a very high resource weighting and by resources, I'm talking about materials. So copper, gold, lumber and uh, energy, which, of course, is uh, crude oil, natural gas. And what you can see, and this is, I think, another is this a 40 year chart. 40 years. Yeah, it's a 40 year so, chart. Yeah. So if you take a look at the left at the bottom panel, the left hand, the red arrow, it's showing you the TSX underperformed from 1980 to 2000. And that's when there was a secular bull market underway in the US from the 80s to 2000s. And what you can see is from 2000, the blue arrow in the bottom panel there, 
uh, that's trending upwards. And that's when the TSX outperformed uh, the S&P 500. That was from 2000 to 2010. This is a straight comparison, right? This, uh, this is a yep. difference comparison. So a down chart means Canada's underperforming and up chart means Canada's outperforming the US. Exactly. And so from 2000 to 2010, that's when, you know, gold reached 1900 and energy, energy crude oil made, remember it was at 140, I believe it made. I was at law school in U of T at the time, I remember. Yeah. So all of those things uh, occurred during that time. And, you know, Canada, of, of course, th the biggest thing that people will remember is uh, w something we'll talk about on the next page. But the key takeaway is that we're once again in the secular bull market in equities, which means uh, resources are underperforming and which means Canada as a whole will underperform. Now, that being said, take a look at your example of Shopify versus uh, versus, you know, the TSX as a whole. So there's certain areas of the TSX composite, certain sectors, certain stocks that will outperform. But there's definitely certain sectors that will underperform. So. Our broad, you know, preference is U.S. over Canada, but you can replicate that outperformance is if you avoid certain sectors and overweight certain sectors in yeah, Canada. I, I think it's incredibly important. I think one of the comments that uh, Martin Robert said uh, in one of our shows a couple of weeks ago was that now more than ever is when you need a portfolio manager because you can't just buy the index right now because there's going to be some dramatic outperformance in certain individual names and some certain sectors whereby the index, the ETFs is, is not going to get you that. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I really like this chart, uh, but it also leads into our next chart about, uh, you know what, uh, do you want to stop on this one for a sec? The TSX, the consolidation? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's a similar chart that we've highlighted on the S and P 500 and the TSX. Now what you can see here is, take a look at those red shaded boxes and they just highlight these big corrections that we've had in the TSX. And this is, I think this goes back to the seventies. So this is a 60 year chart. The key takeaway is right now on RSI, we are at levels that we were both during the financial crisis and during the tech bubble. So to me, this strongly suggests that the worst of the storm has passed and that we should see uh, consolidation and in our view the risks are to the upside and so what i want to highlight is we actually put this deck out uh, about a month ago uh, where we highlighted all these things and everything that we've talked about here has come come to fruition so the, these stocks have indexes have rebounded the tsx is definitely higher from where it was i mean the big question of course now is where do we go from here but uh, our work suggests uh, ultimately higher okay what about the um, the like the narrowing here? This is a log chart, is it not? It is log, yes, right? Yes, yes. So yeah. this is all our log charts chart. are log. So in theory, you should see kind of something more linear on a log chart, not something we're seeing here. It looks like a bit of a flattening at the top. It looks like a trend towards flattening. Is, mm -hmm. is that a concern? No, it's in line with our view of what we saw during, you know, it's TSX is going to continue to to grind higher, but it's not going to be as quick of uh, as a pace as the s p 500 or the nasdaq all right this is our last slide that i want to take you through guys i'm here with javed mirza quantitative technical researcher uh, analyst at canaccord genuity corp javed i get asked probably the most often this question canadian dollar versus us dollar what are your thoughts which one has more strength what are the technical charts telling us i think a lot of listeners might want to close put their hands over their ears right now no, they've heard me say it before. <laughs> okay. So what you can see, and if the best thing to do is look at the, the previous chart where we had the performance of the TSX versus the S&P 500. It's the, literally the exact same chart. So, yeah. So if, if you see the red box on the left-hand side, that was, you know, from the 80s to 2000. Notice uh, the blue shaded box. Then remember, we talked about RSI being above 50 or below 50. Relative so, strength. Being above yeah. 50. And what you could see is from 2000 to 2010, when we had the secular bull market in, uh, in commodities. So that was oil moving to 140, gold, uh, lumber. copper. Yeah, lumber. Everything was ripping. It was amazing uh, as a Canadian um, because move. our currency... You couldn't lose because you're selling your your buck your your dollar went to a buck because you're selling so much in terms of commodities globally, right? 
it was amazing. It was an amazing time to be Canadian. And during that time, it's funny, I was just, you know, uh, just, it was the time to be buying stuff in the US and basically anywhere, US, uh, British pound, uh, whatever, our currency was amazing. Now, unfortunately, it's the opposite. So uh, you can see we've been trending lower and our work says, uh, at the end of this decade, at the very least, we're going to be testing that 63 cent level. Yeah, I'm, I agree with you. I think this is, I, I can't see a situation where the, you know, we're selling oil for a, th a third of what we were a couple of years ago. And that's our, that was our biggest export back then. You're chopping it, in, you know, in, in three. Remember folks that the, the appetite, the, the price movement of Canadian versus you, the Canadian versus us dollar is strictly buyers versus sellers. And you're getting way less buyers of Canadian dollar right now on a purely, you know, quantitative basis. And if you look at the macro factors as well, Javed, you know, are we, are we set to compete globally? You know, that that's another factor that you're probably not considering. Um, but I, I cer it's certainly one that I consider. And I would agree with you that we're going to retest. You think 10 years and we're going to retest that 63 cents kind of thing. Yeah, that's what our work suggests. Short term, we are likely, this is likely a kind of an intermediate high here in the 72, 73 cent range probably, right? Yeah. Well, and if you read my weekly note, I think we're actually going to rally here over the next month or two. I think we're going to test that 73 cent level, which makes sense. Uh, remember, oil's been rallying. It looks like copper wants to rally. Lumber's rallying. All of these risk on cyclicals are rallying. We think there's more upside uh, on the market here into the summer. So it supports our view that uh, the Canadian dollar is going to rally to 73 cents. And another thing that we look at uh, is we really like looking at the commitment of trader data uh, on futures. And right now, uh, the quote unquote smart money is positioned at least over the next couple of months for a rally in the Canadian dollar. People often ask me a question I got online here is, uh, what should I do with my currency if I'm indifferent long term, but I do need some US dollars for my snowboard traveling or whatever it may be? Yeah. I think the answer would be, you know, if you see a fair chunk to US. A fair chunk. If you yeah. see some pushing towards 73, do the rest, mm -hmm. you know, at 72.5 or 73, something like that. Yeah. And especially, exactly, especially around 73, 75. And, and, and the other thing is, I mean, it depends on their income stream, which is something that you can My help job. them with. Yeah, exactly. But if they get Canadian dollars all the time, then, yeah, I think, you know, I would trim into that rally that we see here coming up over the next two months. There's nothing wrong with buying U.S. equities in your U.S. margin account and being long both the U.S. exposure and the U.S. currency. I mean, you, you think that strategy will likely outperform, right? 100%. Yeah. Not 90%, 100%. I like that, yeah. Javed. Um, okay, guys, this is the time I had set aside. I'm incredibly thankful for Javed for taking the time today. I'm definitely going to bring you back, Javed. This was fantastic. Awesome. Thank uh, you for having really me that we did get from the viewers and sorry we didn't have time to address all of them but we will get to them in the future uh, we're going to see if we can make this deck public i know some people have asked if they can get the presentation we're going to see if we can get it approved and get it out in your hands i can't see why that would be an issue uh javed uh, mirza i want to thank you javed mirza quantitative uh technical research analyst at canaccord genuity wealth management uh, i'm rob tatro from robtatro.com portfolio manager here at canaccord genuity wealth management the tatro wealth advisor group before you guys go, I do need to make a huge announcement. We got some big guests booked that are coming. Uh, first of all, our next, uh, what am I going to run here, Mox? Our next guest, uh, Dr. Steven Terrio. So he's a CEO of Cytophage. Um, they're going to be, uh, he's going to be on the show Monday. So we're, he's a virologist. So we're going to talk a bit about the, the virus and uh, what they're working on. Some really neat stuff on the virology. That's Monday. After that, we got Ivan Bojoli. He is CEO of Bold Commerce. Javed, have you heard of Bold Commerce? No huge Manitoba success story. These guys have, I don't know how many thousands of employees. Uh, they started out in their parents' basement. I played volleyball with Yvan uh, back in the day at uh, 1999 in Memram Cook. Uh, Yvan Boisjoli and there's four, uh, Steph Menard and uh, four, four uh, buddies and uh, they started a business. They uh, produce uh, apps that you get, I, I don't want to misquote and miss say this, but basically they produce, they create and produce apps that they sell to people who sell on Shopify. Oh, that's great. And they've got unbelievable growth. These guys are just crushing it. They got offices in, I don't know, four or five cities now. They keep expanding. They're hiring every single week. Fantastic story. I'm really excited to get Ivan Bojali on our show. He'll talk about the Shopify story, I'm sure. After that, we got a dragon coming on our show. 
uh, live from CBC's Dragon Den on May 25th at 3 p.m. We got Vincenzo Guzzo. So he's the CEO of uh, Cinemas Guzzo. He's a fantastic character, really good time. Uh, I've, I've been following him and some of the stories and some of the videos. He's, he's incredibly passionate about his business. He's very knowledgeable about the industry. And uh, he's he's a great he's going to be a great guest. So, uh, oh, and we got one more too. We got another dragon. We booked another dragon, June first, um, from Dragons. Then live on Monday, June first at three p.m. We got Bruce Croxon. So this was uh, he's round thirteen. He's a venture cap. He's an investor. He's an entrepreneur. He's a great guy. He's got a huge following online. We're thrilled to have him on the show as well. So those are some upcoming guests. Javid, you set some pretty big shoes to fill. Hopefully they could fill your shoes as a guest here. Looking forward to them. Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks today, Leela. Thank you for the comment. Everyone have a great day. Stay safe. And I will see you Monday right here. Same place, same time on the Tatro show. Have a great day. Right. Thanks, Rob.